do us all a favor and just keep scrolling through cause if you do comment I'll just delete it and block you. Here's how you know that this guy's song is weak cause he avoids anyone with biblical critique. <laughs> <laughs> this is stupid. And that's what happens to conservative Christians when they get to heaven and discover that God is a queer black woman. This, my friends, is the mother gospel. And welcome back to a brand new video here at Wise Disciple. I am Nate Sala, and I'm helping you become the effective Christian that you were meant to be. Today we are going down the rabbit hole once again into the realm of TikTok where all the good theology lives. What's that? Still not true, huh? All right. Okay. Well, let's see what passes off as theology these days. If this is your first time, I would love for more people to read the Bible with me here on YouTube. So go ahead and click that like button and share this one around. Also, um, pray because uh, here we go. As long as I don't tell anyone they're going to hell, isn't it okay for me to believe in that? No. And it, <laughs> here's why. Because it leads to morally questionable theology and behavior. Let me give you an example. Let's he just said, believing in hell leads to morally questionable theology and behavior. You heard that, right? Did you? That's what he said, right? Say that someone walks into a school and pulls out an assault rifle and shoots 17 people. Well, if you believe in the devil, you might well say, this is the devil at work in the world. And there's not much that we can do about that. God is going to take care of this someday. Uh, we don't have to worry about it. You see, it shifts the responsibility from us to God. And then, all of a sudden, sending out thoughts and prayers is a perfectly valid response. That's all we need to do is send out our thoughts and prayers. It doesn't make us ask the really hard questions like, why is it almost exclusively white men committing these mass shootings? Or... Do average citizens really need to own assault rifles? The answer to that is no. Or, why do we allow legislators to remain in office who openly worship their true God, the NRA? So, uh, that took a turn. Uh, <laughs> right? So, believing in hell leads people to pray for the victims of mass shootings. That's what he just said, though, right? I, 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 think, I think what leads people to pray for the victims of mass shootings, instead of like passing anti-gun laws, which is where I think this person is wanting to go with the speech, I think that has more to do with uh, a principled argument against infringing the Second Amendment, right? So, so what I'm looking for when I watch videos like this is more of a direct line of reasoning that begins with a belief in hell— and then culminates in uh, simply praying for victims but not passing anti-gun laws. I, I think this man forgot the principled political argument from folks who don't want to infringe the constitutional right to bear arms. To make a more principled argument refuting the belief in hell, you would actually just need to deal with the scripture. But wait a second. The concept of hell is clearly taught by, wait for it, Jesus himself. Uh, Matthew 10, 28, Jesus says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. As a matter of fact, uh, take a look at uh, Matthew 5, 29. Uh, Jesus says, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Uh, verse 30, And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. I would be thoroughly interested in hearing someone like this uh, man explain away these passages to the point where it has no meaning whatsoever. What Jesus was teaching here was actually referring to nothing at all. I, I, I would need to, that would be a very interesting exercise to witness. I, I would need to hear some kind of an argument for this. Modern Christians think that women are beneath men because the man was created first, right? When I was in high school, I used this argument in Bible class once. 
This was senior year. Our Bible teacher, who was just a couple years older than us, goes on this whole rant about how women are beneath men and they're supposed to be subservient to men. And that's what the Bible says. So, I'm so let's see what the Bible actually says, you know? Um, since this lady's story so far, and maybe she will, she will do this in a minute, but so far she hasn't given us chapter and verse, um, I'm going to have to guess what that might be. Like, it maybe sounds like we're dealing with 1 Timothy chapter 2 or something like that, right? Uh, 1 Timothy 2, that's where the Apostle Paul, he's writing to the church, he's trying to deal with an issue that is going on inside the church at Ephesus, starting in verse 11, "'Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness.'" I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, rather she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. I just did a debate teacher reacts on this. It was uh, Askell versus McKissick, and there are a lot of principled arguments and exegesis in the debate, so I encourage all of you to check that out. But I will say this. Even for those complementarians who would argue that there is a hierarchy of authority in the dynamic of relationship between Adam and Eve, which is really hard to argue against. I mean, Paul's appeal to Adam being created first in this passage is really hard to ignore. Uh, and it also immediately takes the Jewish audience back to the special relationship of all firstborns to their father. I mean, that's why Paul makes this statement in the first place. All firstborns receive special birthrights from their fathers, as opposed to the other children in the family. And we see this play out time and again in the Old Testament with families, um, and it affords the firstborns special status with special responsibilities. Having acknowledged all of this, there are absolutely no complementarians who would say that women are beneath men. Rather, men and women are both made equal, uh, they have equal value in the sight of God, made in God's image, but they have different roles within the dynamic of the family. And this is also reflected in the dynamic of the church. Uh, by the way, these, these uh, different roles are also reflected in biology, because guess what? There are no men who can have babies. So, sorry to burst someone's bubble here. Uh, I, I can't assume everybody understands that these days. I'm in a bit of a chaotic mood that day, so I decide to have all the audacity and ask them, why? Some guy in the front row says, well, because we were made first, man was made first. And I came to the exact same conclusion that you did. I was like, well, wouldn't that mean that animals and plants and trees would be above us then? And the Bible teacher laughs in my face and says, Taryn, go outside and go try and tell a tree what to do. Go do that. See what happens. And I'm sitting here like, did you miss the point? What, what you just said just proved my point. And then I try and tell him that, well, that's what I'm arguing, and you're just proving my point. And immediately he interrupts me. He's like, oh, we got to move on. So I take what this lady says at face value. If her story went exactly the way that she said it did, uh, then this Bible teacher should not have responded by saying, go outside and talk to a tree, <laughs> right? <laughs> what he should have done was go to Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8, verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him? and the son of man that you care for him. This is a psalmist talking to the Lord. Uh, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands and have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, uh, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever pass, passes along the paths of the seas. So mankind's status separates us from all other sort of created beings on this planet. Why? Because God made us specifically to be slightly lower than, well, and in the Hebrew, uh, we have the word the Elohim, which is a word that refers to supernatural beings that God has created in heaven. It's actually a, a category that encompasses all divine beings, including God himself. That is a feature that animals and, you know, trees and rocks, they do not share which is why mankind was given the job of having dominion over them. Genesis 1.26 says the same thing. Verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have, here it is, dominion, over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, again, the creation of mankind. It's a completely separate category to the creation of trees and animals, and we are to have dominion over the rest of creation. But when you enter into the sort of the specific category of mankind, it does matter that Adam was created first. 
That's literally what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Does that mean that women are to be abused and mistreated and and, and we men should act like uh, they're over women, that women are beneath men? Absolutely not. And anyone who does that is rejecting God's design for mankind. Hey, I'm a Christian and I'm here to tell you that if you identify as LGBTQ, well, my faith compels me to let you know you are wonderfully made and God loves you so. Yes, I am saying that it's in no way a sin. It's a beautiful reflection of the image of God inside of you, like all people. And that's something that we share, and it's one way we see God's beauty everywhere. Now a note to all the haters who think I am wrong and need to say so in the comments rather than just sing along. Well, do us all a favor and just keep scrolling through, because if you do comment, I'll just delete it and block you. Now again to all my siblings who are LGBT+, remember you are beautiful. Beautiful and precious and loved by God and us exactly as you are. Amen. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I play a little guitar. So, uh, yeah, let, let, let's, uh, let's try something. Let's try something here. If you read the Bible like I do, then the context will guide you and show you how to look at how God feels about the way that people sin, cause he's not very happy in 1 Corinthians 6. Cause you practice LGBTQ, the kingdom of God is not the place for you. But if you repent, then there's good news for you. There's a huge happy ending and God will make you new. How about that? Was that a... <laughs> uh, here's how you know that this guy's song is weak Cause he avoids anyone with biblical critique <laughs> This is stupid Rationalization is the act of applying logic or reason To justify something you already believe And though it uses logic and reason It is different from critical thinking Critical thinking is the pursuit of an answer Rationalization is the pursuit of evidence For something you already believe and rationalization is exactly so it looks like this lady is responding to a comment that is highly critical of her it's 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 on the uh it's on the screen there um it says i love that you're trying to apply your peon brain rationalization to the almighty your questions are childlike and you'll be judged god is justice Whew. um maybe this is a good time to say this don't do that guys don't do that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, don't go trolling somebody else's page. I mean, this is this is not the way to engage non-believers. As a matter of fact, this is in violation of the biblical command to avoid engagement. There, there, there's all kinds of places in the scripture that 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 tell you when you engage people, when you engage non-believers, do it a certain way or don't do it. The Bible says, season your words with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Salt, not bitter vinegar, <laughs> right? First Peter 3 tells us that our conduct must be uh, with gentleness and respect, you know? First uh, John teaches the same thing. So, so when we get on social media, we are, our attitude and our posture should be that we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ, which looks like the opposite of this comment. Exactly what I did every day as a Christian. It's literally what I was taught to do. I, and I'm absolutely certain you too, were indoctrinated into Christianity. That means we were uncritically taught that God exists and that God is good. We were taught these things before we even had the capability of critical thinking. And they were reinforced constantly. So I totally understand where this lady is coming from. I think that you can make the argument that there are a number of folks who have been indoctrinated into the faith. Um, but don't hold it for good, solid reasons. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of folks deconstruct and walk away from the faith, you know? Okay, fair enough. My story is uh, different, though. I was raised in church, but I was not saved. So maybe a non-charitable take on my story then is that I was indoctrinated into Christianity. But as I got older and started questioning whether or not I truly believed what I was taught, I decided at the time that I didn't believe it. And so I left the church, and I actually stayed away until I was 30 years old. But here's the thing. I'm a Christian now, and the reason I'm a Christian today is because, guess what? It's all true. Jesus really did rise again from the dead, and Jesus really is coming back one day to judge the world. 
just because my pastors couldn't explain to me why Christianity was true back when I was growing up has nothing to do with the fact that it is actually true. And I wish more of us had the capability to help young folks particularly understand this point. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Every children's song, every catechism, every bedtime prayer, that is indoctrination. And then, as we gained the ability to reason, we were given the justifications. Some of us formally, like myself, in actual apologetics classes, and others through just the sermons and culture they were raised in. But that, what I just described, my history, and I'm absolutely certain yours too, was rationalization. Asking the tough questions now is not rationalization. It's critical thinking. Look, asking tough questions is absolutely commendable, and all people, Christian and non-Christian alike, should ask tough questions of their pastors and their church leaders. But what happens when those tough questions have sufficient answers? See, this is what's missing from this TikTok. There are two components to a person's thought processing and their decision-making, um, and I would even add to their belief formation, and that is intellect and emotion. God has created us in His infinite wisdom to be the intersection of both intellect and emotions. So what happens to a person when they discover a truth that they do not like? That's the question that you need to wrestle with. And guess what? We know what happens even from like a secular standpoint, uh, be, because many people, when they find out that they have stage four cancer, for example, they go through denial. What is denial but the person reacting to true information, accurate information, where their emotions are all wrapped up in that reaction? Well, the same thing is true for the existence of God. The Bible teaches that there are a lot of folks who do not rejoice to discover that God exists. Instead, they act as if they have found out about stage four cancer. Why? Well, because their emotions are all wrapped up in their response. John chapter three, verse 19, uh, it says this, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Romans one essentially tracks along the same lines. It's not about the best arguments or the best evidence for God. What this is really about is being led around and shaped by what you love. And that's how human beings function. That's, that's how they operate. And God knows this, which is why the solution to the human condition is not intellectual enlightenment. It's about embracing God in relationship that saves you. That's what saves you. First John 4, look at this, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God. You notice the word that keeps repeating over and over again, right? Is it uh, evidence? Is it, you know, the best thoughts? Uh, the best rational, uh, rational, logical process to get you from A to B, therefore God exists? No, it's love. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. There it is. Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love God and love each other. And in this simple yet profound act, we let the love of God flow through us. That is what it means to be a Christian. Now that said, if my brain is nothing but a peon and only capable of childlike questions, then that means that yours is too. If my mere human brain is not capable of understanding your God and judging your God, then neither is yours. We are both subject to the exact same human limitations. Which means if I cannot decide that a God is bad, then you cannot decide that a God is good. And if I have no business criticizing him, then you have no business worshiping him. If we are too limited mm. in our understandings, then neither of us should be making any judgments. If there's a chance that I could mistakenly be criticizing a good deity, then there's a chance that you could mistakenly be worshiping a bad one. And neutrality should be where we both land. But you seem fully intent on worshiping, so I don't think you actually believe this. I think you just don't have a good answer, and you want me to shut up. But hey, 
I can tell you that I have been through the process of hearing uncomfortable things about my faith, of facing uncomfortable questions, and of feeling that discomfort of not having a good answer. And at first, it really did make me angry just like this. And I'm not sure I was kind to people either. And I encourage you to just sit with that discomfort and maybe listen to more questions. Because a God that would judge us for using our brains is probably not a good God, huh? We have human limitations. This is what the lady was saying. Uh, we have human limitations. We're not going to be able to grasp the things of God. That is absolutely the case, by the way. Unless God has revealed himself. That's what, that's what the point is. If God exists in our human brains can't fathom the depths of his knowledge and existence. By the way, this is what the Bible teaches. Look at this, Isaiah 55, verse 8. From my th This is the Lord speaking. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Okay, so this doesn't take Christianity by surprise. Okay, that this lady would say something like this, you know, human limitations, you know, we're, we're, we're both struggling and trying to reach towards something that we don't quite understand. The problem is this lady assumes that God has not revealed himself when he actually has. And so, yes, we Christians can actually talk about the Lord based on the way that he has revealed himself to us over the history of mankind. Once again, I would remind us all that conversations like this, um, particularly from the side of folks like this lady, seems like uh, an ex-Christian, uh, someone who was in church at some point and then walked away. I'm sure there's a story there. Um, and, you know, her story, I would love to hear it, actually. Um, and we should be thoroughly interested in listening to everyone's story. Everyone's story is important, right? But these kinds of conversations are incredibly misleading because of one simple fact. All the stuff that this lady has said, she left out one important factor, and it's emotions. There is a slide, actually. I use this slide all the time in my presentations. The Bible talks about emotions quite a bit. As a matter of fact, our emotions are all wrapped up in our uh, decisions and our beliefs. Uh, social scientists affirm this as well. I mean, you can look at Jonathan Haidt's work in this area. It affirms the Bible's teaching on this. But when you hear folks like this lady, they make it sound like their fundamental problem was a logical problem. It wasn't a logical problem, guys. Emotions were all wrapped up in the decision to leave Christianity behind. I don't know this lady. I've never seen her before this video. I guarantee you there is a story that involves um, the emotions. Here's another way to illustrate the point. There's a great question that Frank Turek suggests for Christians to ask, you know, to non-believers. If the God of the Bible exists would you become a Christian? Watch what the non-believer says next, because I think it can be very telling. And that's what happens to conservative Christians when they get to heaven and discover that God is a queer black woman. <laughs> is that the, that's the whole video. That's the, the, the whole video. Is there, does he make more videos? Is there, there's no other videos where he's talking about this. God is a queer black woman. Um, that's amazing. Where in the Bible are we taught this? Is there anything that even comes close to teaching something in the ballpark of this? Absolutely not. For you are our father, though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us. You, O oh Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from of old is your name. You know, 1 John 3, 1, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Now, obviously, God is not a human being. He's a spirit. He's not even a biological being. We as biological beings were made in God's image, but we are not God, and He is not us, which is probably in some strange way the basis for this person's claim about God being a queer black woman. But there... <laughs> There is a reason why the Lord decided to relate to us by using anthropomorphic descriptors like father, the father of us, making us his children, you know, if we abide in him, if you follow Jesus Christ, and Jesus as well, as God's son. Jesus teaches us to refer to God as, as, as the Abba, our, our father. He never said anything otherwise. So, boy, I, I really would not start playing around with those descriptors because you think intersectionality is so hot right now. That Hansel's so hot right now. As a matter of fact, it looks to me like there is no reverence whatsoever in this man when he talks about God or the way that God has decided to reveal himself to us using those 
uh, specific kinds of anthropomorphic descriptors. You know, again, no care with his words to respect the teaching of the scripture. I'd say that this man needs to pay a lot closer attention to how God has chosen to reveal himself in the word. You just knocked a glass of wine off a table at a friend's house. There's nothing more comforting in that moment than to find out it doesn't matter. For them to say, no big deal. It can still matter to you, which is why you're bustling around cleaning up glass and dabbing the red wine with white wine, life hack alert, but it doesn't really matter. Now, strangely, it can actually feel gratifying to solve this problem you caused. But if your friend was pissed or sad about the broken glass or the spilled wine, it would still matter, but in a stressful way. It's the exact same way with life. The universe is our host, and they've said, no big deal about everything. Our ultimate host is not pissed or sad. They just don't care. Nothing really matters. And this is what gives us... <laughs> so, I, every time I hear the phrase, nothing really matters, I immediately hear Bohemian Rhapsody. The real life. Anybody else? Just me, huh? This is Abraham Piper. Uh, so, that's John Piper's son, right? Notice Piper's words here. The universe doesn't care. Then he says, our ultimate host doesn't care. So we have the universe on the one hand, I guess, which if you're not a religious person means matter, molecules, and materiality. There, there is no God. There is no supernatural realm. There's just the physical. But then Piper says, well, you have an ultimate host. So which is it? Impersonal universe or ultimate host? Us, the freedom to feel our own meaning and feel it with ease instead of a sense of fear or guilt. This, my friends, is the mother gospel. You like good news? The universe doesn't give a On the flip side, if there were ultimate meaning in the universe, life would be completely pointless. But that's for another video. Come along if you want to. In the meantime, take a deep breath. Nothing matters, so anything can. So nothing really matters, according to Piper, and that's the gospel. The good news is nothing matters, guys. As a matter of fact, if there was ultimate meaning in the universe, then life would be pointless, except, wait, what? <laughs> like, what? Unless there's some amazing logical gymnastics up ahead, which I can't imagine that there is, then this is, this is just gobbledygook being passed off as cleverness. William Lane Craig has unpacked this, uh, I think, in his book, uh, Reasonable Faith. But he also uses uh, this as one of his main contentions and arguments against atheists. And the point is, he says, if there is no God, then it makes no difference if someone has lived as a Nazi or a nun. Stalin or saint, as Craig puts it. Why? Well, because without God, there is no objective morality, and therefore no standard to judge our own actions in this life, whether they are truly good or evil. As a matter of fact, those terms that we use, we throw them around, they mean nothing. They're just words, but they're not meaningful descriptions of our actions as it is measured by an objective standard. Once that truly sinks in for folks, like really deep down in their bones, this leads to existential dread. Some of the greatest philosophers of all time wrote volumes trying to deal with this very issue. Dostoevsky had a lot to say about this as well. He famously said in the, in the Brothers Karamazov, if God does not exist, then everything is permitted. Everything. So Piper is not, you know, broaching some new kind of topic at all. We've recognized as a people long ago that discovering objective meaning and purpose in your life is essential to human flourishing. But that forces you to confront the inevitable conclusion that for objective meaning and purpose to exist, God must exist. This is the end of the video. He's got to have one more. If the universe had a meaning, your life would be pointless. Three reasons. One, being aware of an ultimate meaning would be a f spoiler. We'd know the whole point. Life would be like watching a game you recorded to watch later, but then you accidentally found out who won. Pointless. Two. If well, uh, 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 being aware, <laughs> being aware of ultimate meaning would be a spoiler. So the search for what gives you meaning is the same thing as what actually gives you meaning. I'm I'm not following this. If uh, if the meaning of life is discovered in the greatest commandment, right? So, so now I'm speaking as a Christian, right? Uh, Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is approached and asked, what is the greatest commandment? This is what he says, verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets, okay? So, Loving God and loving the people around you. If that's what you realize gives you ultimate meaning in life, how is knowing that keeping you from actually fulfilling that? 
I, I think Piper confuses the search for ultimate meaning with actually fulfilling or or realizing ultimate meaning in your own life. Those, those are two different things altogether. If there's a known ultimate meaning, then we all have a moral obligation to make our life about that thing. This is where religions come from. It is the one meaning of the universe, after all. And if we all must do one thing, we're tools, cogs, pawns. Pick your metaphor. And what does that make life? Pointless. Three. Well, uh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> TikTok, slow down. So, so Piper's right about this, to a degree. If there is an ultimate and objective meaning or purpose to the universe, then we do have a moral obligation to fulfill our purpose aligned to that ultimate meaning. So I, I'm, I'm using meaning and purpose synonymously here. But wait a sec, Piper is propo- uh, he, he's presupposing that if there is ultimate meaning and you align yourself to that and fulfill it in, in your own life, that somehow you'll actually be unsatisfied with that. That you'll, you'll become a tool, a, a cog, a pawn. Again, this is just confused. I mean, think about this. If there is ultimate objective meaning in life, and we discover what that is, and we start living according to that, wouldn't we be fully satisfied? Wouldn't we have other uh, virtuous qualities that overflow out of living according to our purpose? Like, you know, like hope, endurance, and strength. I mean, you know, this is not news to secular people. Uh, there, there was a famous cliche saying when I was a, te- a teacher in the classroom, and it was, know your why. Because if you know your why, you can endure anyhow. By the way, I think that's true. That's why it's vitally important that we understand why we're here on this earth, what we're supposed to do. But that begins with the fact that we're here because we were put here by our Creator for a reason. Watch this. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. There is a beautiful partnership on a very practical level that we are invited into when we live our lives. It is a life lived out of the overflow of our relationship with our Creator right? That's Galatians 2.20, right? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's not us sidelined on the bench, watching a game that's already been played, you know? We are in the game. We are actively playing the game. We just know what the game is now, if we know our purpose. And now we're taking risks. We're taking L's sometimes. We're taking W's other times, right? And we're living all of that out. I mean, that's just a, it's a wonderful and amazing thing. And Piper just doesn't seem to understand this at all. This to me sounds like really awful ad hoc reasoning to justify his rejection of God. If there's an ultimate meaning, nothing else matters in comparison. Who gives a shit about your little family, for instance? It's nothing compared to the universe's mega meaning. Some people actually believe this and it makes them nut jobs, but that's a different topic. Ultimate meaning negates the value of everything else that matters to you, making life, you guessed it, pointless. Some- Again, this is thoroughly confused. If I, I mean, I can't believe I actually have to say this. Like, this is, this is, to me, this is elementary. If the meaning of life is discovered and fulfilled through your relationship with your creator and your love for the people around you, then your family doesn't become unimportant. I mean, uh, loving them becomes one of the most important things that you will ever do. I mean, boy, this is, this is, a, this is a huge logic fail. I don't even think true nihilists would argue this way. And that's ultimately what Piper is flirting with here. It's nihilism. Summary. Ultimate meaning would cause personal meaninglessness. Ultimate meaninglessness allows personal meaning. But just because ultimate meaning would suck doesn't mean it's not real. Lots of things are real and suck. Fortunately, it's also logically impossible. But I'm out of time, so that's for another video. Maybe. Come along if you feel like it. Yeah, I don't feel like it. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think I'm done. I think I'm. Let, let's let's conclude. So I got lively, okay, guys. I, you know, I'm I'm dealing with things that are not commensurate with what uh, the Lord has taught and what the Bible teaches, and so I get lively. But look, don't misunderstand my heart. These folks are not deplorables. They should not be dismissed. We should pray for their salvation. It, it, it is really not too late for any of these folks to have a real encounter with the God of Heaven and repent and follow after Jesus. That was my story. And I know when I walked away from the church and I was gone for a very long time, living for myself, I know my friends and my family never stopped praying for me. So let's keep praying for them. Thank you so much for watching this video with me. Hopefully there were some things in there that got you thinking. Uh, If you made it this far, congratulations. You should join us on our Patreon community where you can interact with me directly and catch these videos as I film them live. 
Uh, you can check out my Patreon page. The link is in the description. I'm going to take a break and return soon with more videos for your perusal. But in the meantime, I'll say bye for now. <laughs>